I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Essie Veeding. She is a professor of developmental psychopathology at the University College London. She's also the author of Psychopathy, a very short introduction, and I think fair to say, one of the world's leading experts on the study of psychopaths. Dr. Veeding, welcome to the Nature and Nurture podcast. Thanks very much. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. I'm glad, I'm glad to have you here. So Dr. Veeding, how did you first become interested in studying uh, either psychopathy or, or just psychology in general? So uh, psychology in general, I, um, I was sort of uh, debating between architecture and uh, psychology or li literature. Right. And mm -hmm. um, then I, I got together with an English man uh, and uh, he was never going to uh, be studying in, in Finland. So Finnish literature, which would have been kind of one of my choices, was out of the window uh, because I thought I have to look into uh, studying in, um, in the UK. And then around the that time, I was reading um, Salinger's Catcher in the Rye, which I found extremely fascinating account of someone who's, whose mind is fractionating. And uh, that sort of then piqued my interest sufficiently to um, apply for psychology courses. And I uh, got into the undergraduate program in UCL, which is a very good psychology course. And during my undergrad degree, I had lectures from James Blair, who is um, a, a very eminent researcher into psychopathy, particularly neural basis of psychopathy. And I found his research really fascinating. And um, towards the end of my degree, I was thinking that I, I wasn't sure whether I wanted to do a PhD or, or clinical um, psychology degree. And in the, in the UK, it's a bit different than the system in the uh, United States. So there you do a clinical PhD and it's a, it's a long PhD program and you, you do your sort of um, clinical practice rotations uh, as part of that PhD. Whereas in the UK, it's more streamed. So you either do a straight research PhD or you do doctorate in clinical psychology, which is pure practice in the doctorate with a, with a smaller research component. Uh, and in order to get into clinical psychology, you have to work a couple of years in clinically relevant area. And around the time that I was finishing my degree, James Blair advertised for a research assistant posts in his team. And I applied and I, I got the post. And uh, then um, as I was, was doing the research assistant job, I thought this is too fascinating. Um, I think I, I would probably be um, happier doing research uh, than, uh, than being a clinician. So I then applied for a PhD program after that. and and. Um, um, because I was researching uh, with James adults with psychopathy, um, it sort of really struck me that all of these people have really long-standing histories of antisocial behavior. Um, and uh, some have very troubling uh, family histories, others don't. And I thought it would be really fascinating to do research into antecedents of psychopathy as, as we know it in adults, as an adult personality disorder, obviously. Kids don't get it as a birthday present when they turn 18. So um, I thought it would be really interesting um, to use different methodologies to try and understand why some people are at risk of developing the disorder. And, and that's what led me into doing research in the area. Mm -hmm. That is very interesting. And so you were involved in neuroimaging research from the start? Well, uh, when I was working with uh, James, he was doing neuroimaging research. I was more involved in the behavioral projects that he was leading both in, in children and also in adults. Uh, but I did my own, I moved into doing some neuroimaging research later on in, in my own research, but I wasn't um, involved in, in that research when I was working with James. Because mm -hmm. that sounds like it, it was probably a pretty pioneering time to be involved. But in James that. definitely conducted the sort of the, uh, among the first uh, research studies um, in, in adults with psychopathy. That's very cool. So how is your research uh, focused or, or focus transition since doing your PhD to, to where you are now? Um, I'm, I wouldn't say that it's, well, I think all of it is plucking away quite slowly. So during my PhD, I um, worked with people who did behavior genetics research. So used twin methodology to estimate relative importance of genetic and environmental influences on the traits. So um, that that was a great opportunity for me to learn uh, those methods and to use them to answer some interesting questions about um, children who might be at risk of developing psychopathy. So, so comparing uh, 
those who have sort of antisocial behavior with psychopathic features to those who have antisocial behavior and who don't have psychopathic features and then look at the relative importance of genetic and environmental influences in the two groups. And what we found in our studies that uh, in the group of children who had antisocial behavior combined with these psychopathic features, including lack of empathy and lack of remorse, uh, the antisocial behavior was strongly uh, heritable for those children, but not for the other children who had antisocial behavior early onset, but who, who didn't have the psychopathic features. So that was sort of an interesting um, finding because it suggested that you may have different etiologies uh, for antisocial behavior, depending on whether you have um, these um, callous and unemotional features, lack of empathy, lack of remorse, or mm. not. Uh, wow. We also looked at the heritability of, of the callous traits on their own, looked at the longitudinal uh, developmental trajectories of them. So one of the recent uh, papers we've published um, has looked at uh, initial genetic risk for displaying uh, callous and emotional traits, and then your developmental trajectories and um, what we found out is that the genetic and environmental influences that are important for the initial risk are actually quite different from the ones that influence your developmental trajectory. So uh, there seems to be a low degree of overlap. And that's a, that's a sort of a finding that really gave me pause for thought because there has been a lot of emphasis uh, in relation to conduct problems in relation to callous and emotional traits on very early prevention and that's no doubt very important but what our research suggests is that for those children and families who are most vulnerable the early intervention could be thought of as a sort of an inoculation but you may still need booster shots along the way with sort of AIDS appropriate interventions for, for the children who are most at risk. So we shouldn't think that the early intervention is a sort of a silver bullet that will fix everything. There will be some people who have multiple vulnerabilities and, and for whom there ought to be age appropriate help available at different points in their development. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. So, so in addition to these, these harder upbringings, you have a genetic risk factor that you've been uh, looking to identify? So we, we haven't, I mean, I've been involved in few molecular genetic uh, studies uh, that have tried to do genome-wide association, um, sort of combing through the genome and seeing uh, what associations we might find in relation to both antisocial behavior and, and these callous and emotional features. And we really haven't had many big hits. Now, that's very much uh, what seems to be the story from most psychiatric disorders. So what is emerging is that most traits or vulnerabilities or disorders are influenced by multiple genes of small effect size and it's a sort of a probabilistic cumulative risk so it's not that there are there's a sort of a single gene that is going to determine that you either become a psychopath or you don't become a psychopath uh, it's not even a handful of genes it's probably we're talking about my educated guess hundreds of genes that are important in uh, putting someone at risk and the risk is not deterministic. So uh, in the same way as uh, we could think about some of us uh, having um, genes that put us at a higher risk of developing heart disease or high hypertension, but we can also control that risk by our diet or exercise. I think that uh, for most uh, mental health conditions, most behavioral disorders, there will be, there are individuals who have higher genetic risk. And I think that we need to recognize that if we want to help those people, but we need to get away from thinking that somehow that genetic risk is deterministic. So we need to be able to uh, really think creatively around what might be those environmental factors that we can support and put in place that can help, help the individual. So in a way, I am personally less interested in finding the actual genes because I think for complex behavioral disorders, it's very unlikely that we're going to fix something trivially with um, medication, for instance. I think knowing about the genetic risk is just important if we are to try and understand how we might inter intervene and also try and understand the environment better. So we often like to think of social environment as something that happens to the child, but of course the social environment is not some sort of a random thing or a vacuum. The child is an active part of co-creating their own social environment. So I think understanding that there are children who are who have predispositions to be more temperamentally difficult, who may not develop empathy 
typically who may not have the same affect regulation skills as their peers. I think that will help frame to the parents and to the teachers what the child's particular difficulties might be. Uh, it should also give us uh, impetus as a society to provide really solid support for parents and teachers who are faced with the child who's very difficult so that those individuals don't burn out. Uh, and then combined with uh, neuroscience and cognitive research, we can then also think about, well, what might be the things that those children find particularly motivating, particularly rewarding, what makes them tick so that we can try and instantiate proper, good, kind of societally acceptable behavior in children who may function a little bit differently from your, your average Joe. Mm -hmm. That reminds me a bit of, I think, Richard Tremblay's research. Uh, do I have that correctly? I think he's Canadian that studies aggression yep. in young children. Yeah. Um, so from what I remember from that research, he finds that some children are just temperamentally disposed towards being more aggressive, but then they can become socialized such that they can sort of focus their aggression. Maybe it's it's through competitive sports or games or something like that. And it's only the small set of subset of children that don't learn how to properly integrate their aggression that that might become uh, antisocial. Yeah, no, that's absolutely correct. And I think what, what I find interesting is people often find it very easy to accept that someone who is very anxious, for instance, would be temperamentally predisposed to being that way. But then somehow I think that there is, there is something that uh, is very distasteful to us about thinking about children as having a greater capacity for for uh, antisocial behavior or for evil <laughs> than other children. But it stands to reason that just as well as there are individual differences in how nervous someone is, how temperamentally anxious someone is, there will be individual differences in how prone to aggress in somebody is, how, how someone might find it more difficult to regulate their emotions or more difficult to empathize with other people. Mm -hmm. And I think that that also has interesting implications when we think about treatment. So I often hear people saying, well, should we just teach these children more empathy? But actually, most of us, you know, we don't have to teach ourselves empathy. It's, just, it's you know, feeling for someone else when they are in distress or feeling for their joy is a very, very natural, very automatic um, process. You know, I, you know, if my child cries, I don't sort of think, oh, I really need to crack that empathy up now. It's a very kind of uh, swift, unconscious emotional contagion and then often you actually when you are with with your children or with friends you have to regulate your emotions to then engage sympathetically with that person and do the kind of the appropriate things to, to comfort them right. because especially when someone's in distress it's it's very distressing for you yourself as well if you are somebody who naturally feels empathy mm -hmm. now individuals who are on the anxiety disorder spectrum can't help but sort of ruminate uh, worry feel anxious about things and they have a strong intrinsic motivation to do something about it because it's actually not a pleasant feeling to ruminate and to worry. Now individuals who have high levels of psychopathic traits don't feel bad so they don't get this emotional contagion they don't they're not touched by somebody else feeling sad so this intrinsic motivation to do something about your condition at least for the reasons of empathy is very unlikely to be there. And whilst I wouldn't want to completely write off the idea that we might be able to teach these children some level of empathy or, or get them to experience some level of emotional contagion, I do think that there are probably biologically calibrated sort of, um, well, there's, there's probably a biologically calibrated window within which you can move. So somebody who doesn't naturally get this emotional contagion, you might be able to up it a little bit, but whether you up it sufficiently so that it comes online every time and, and that you can elicit a typical experience of empathy, I'm not sure. So I think with these individuals, we do need to sort of think about, well, what can we use to motivate good behavior in these individuals if the sort of the typical things don't do it for them, as it were. Mm -hmm. Is this empathy synonymous with personality trait agreeableness or is it something distinct that can be distinctly measured from that? Well, I think there's probably some overlap in a sense that I would imagine that individuals who are high on agreeableness are individuals who are able to share in other people's joys and other people's emotional 
experience. I would imagine that if you break empathic processing down to sort of component processes such as, you know, emotional contagion, which we can see as an antecedent, sort of a building block for the empathic experience, obviously those sort of component processes wouldn't be synonymous with the complex personality traits such as agreeableness, but no doubt contribute to it. Mm -hmm, that makes sense. So I'm also wondering um, how, how stable are these traits over the lifespan? Like if you have a kid who's, who you're finding to, to be very um, disagreeable or unempathetic, does it, does that, is that a good predictor of their adult behavior or is it something that can be changed over time? So it, it can definitely be changed over time and it can change over time sort of naturally. We don't necessarily know always uh, what makes, uh, makes it change. So we don't yet have a very good understanding of the things that promote sort of stability or change in those sorts of traits. We have some studies uh, where we have longitudinal analyses and we can see the kinds of things that are associated with uh, having stable or changing trajectories. So if you are in a stable, high callous, unemotional trajectory, for instance, you're more likely to have um, experienced uh, harsh, harsh and um, sort of inconsistent parenting. Uh, more likely to have experienced less warm parenting, more likely to have had parents who've had some mental health problems themselves, or, or more likely to have had uh, some um, other disadvantages. But a lot of these studies have, I mean, almost as a rule, these studies have not been uh, conducted in a genetically informative framework. So it's very hard to know how much of those associations are sort of pure environmental effects and how much are a sort of an epiphenomenon of genetic risk that runs in the families. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that that sort of brings me back to the point that I made earlier in that here, it, here is, I think, why it's important to be mindful of these genetically driven individual differences, not because uh, we, we ought to write somebody off because they have genetic risk, but because I think that genetic risk um, means that there are a set of realities when you come to engage in intervention that you really ought to consider. So those set of realities may really mean that different things make that particular child or family thick than, than, than uh, a more mainstream child or family. It may mean that some of the um, capacities of a parent, for instance, to engage in parent training are very different or, or, or less optimal than it might be in, in sort of a more, more sort of well-functioning families. Um, it might mean that you ought to expect that some of these processes will take longer. So you might be able to instantiate, but you shouldn't expect that to be able to instantiate them in the same amount of time as you do them uh, for uh, perhaps children with conduct problems who don't have these traits or, or more typically developing children. So, um, so I, I, I think that the, to me, the genetic framework is a framework for thinking about how you approach the environment. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. And when you think about these individual differences, it seems almost inevitable that you're going to have some extremes in behavior on either end of whatever spectrum you're looking at. So at what point do you, does that go from, let's say, being someone who's just very extreme in this one normal personality trait versus someone who needs like a psychiatric label? I mean, one obvious answer is something like as soon as they become violent or, 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 yeah. criminally antisocial but it it seems like at least something we think about a lot in our popular culture is there's psychopaths lurking everywhere like maybe in in the the ruthless ceo or politician or something yeah. like that someone who stays within the confines of the law but would it would like would still count as a psychopath and is that yeah. still a useful label yeah, so that, I mean, that's a very tricky, tricky question. I think you really, really touched a nerve there in that I think if you would argue that, you know, you know, that there are some individuals who have these traits, but who are not antisocial, I would argue that all the traits you've mentioned in the CCEOs are antisocial. They are just, as you pointed out, antisocial behaviors that don't land you in the prison. Mm -hmm. And of course, because they don't land you in the prison, then it's much harder to call someone into account for those behaviors. And I think that in those cases, I do wonder, you know, whether we need a sort of a two-pronged attack, one of which is to improve um, 
procedures in organizations that will deal with bullying and harassment type of behaviors. And there are certainly signs, at least in the UK, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure in the United States as, as well, that people are taking these sorts of issues more seriously. And there are more structures put into place so that people who are in vulnerable positions or not in positions of power could initiate action. But it still comes at an enormous cost. So I think another, another thing that I think we need so much more research on, but which is enormously important, is why do some people get victimized more easily than others? Which is, we have a lot of research showing that, you know, it's not random who gets victimized. And some, there are particular attributes that um, uh, bullies pick on so that they find who is the, um, who's a more vulnerable um, victim. And this is not to victim blame. It's not the victim's responsibility not to be uh, bullied. But I do think that we, we would probably do well to recognize the reality that some people are more vulnerable to being a target of victimization. And we might need to also try and think about how we can educate people about what is acceptable behavior, what are, accept what are good boundaries to have, and how you might deal with somebody who, who behaves in a way that is really, really not appropriate. Um, so I think Having structures in place that, that deal with this sort of antisocial behavior that is not illegal, or at least not, not, not as easily shown as illegal as, as a really overt aggressive act or embezzlement, and also educating victims might be important. Now, in relation to the sort of when, when would you call it a disorder, I think... I mean, so it's contentious even, you know, should you, should you call something a disorder or should you not call something a disorder? And the lines are always, of course, arbitrary. If we went with the sort of a relatively traditional approach, I think once you start behaving in a way that either harms others or, or is a detriment to yourself, and you, that happens in a consistent manner, then it is clearly something that we ought to be concerned about. However, these chains are traits are not immutable. So particularly when we see them in children, I think there's still a huge amount of hope that they can change and there's evidence to show that they can change. Um, they're not set in stone. Um, so so I, I think that even though we, we may find applying a label useful in order to get help and to know what sort of help is available, we shouldn't think that that's something that is fixed and will necessarily stay with somebody forever. Or should stay with somebody for <laughs> Yeah, I also think it would be great to talk about how these things are measured because to, to my knowledge, it's mostly self-report questionnaires. And I was I was thinking that if you're a smart psychopath and you're reading a questionnaire and it says something like pick one to five, I often like to bully people or or act violently or anything, you're just gonna lie and pick the opposite extreme and make yourself out to be like a gentle little bunny. So uh, is is there a problem with like um, misdiagnosis or, or being able so, to... So no one would diagnose based on self-report. So when we are working with children, uh, we tend to collect reports from teachers and parents. And if you're in a, in a clinic, they, they will do the same in a, with a slightly different protocol than the questionnaires that we use. Mm -hmm. But with children, it's not based on self-report. It's based on reports from teachers and, and reports from parents. Obviously, there are problems there as well, because if a child is very clever, they might be able to do a number of things without getting caught and they might be able to manage impressions. But usually if this sort of behavior has gone on for a long time, um, enough cracks will show that people will, will be picking up, you know, this, this person is lying, this, this person is caught, mm -hmm. is caught doing things that are, are unsavory. Um, in relation to the adults, um, this is certainly more problematic when you think about studying psychopathy in the community where indeed it is based on self-report. But if you look at individuals who are part of the criminal justice system, you will have to do an extensive file review and a semi-structured interview and only people who have been extensively trained to do that uh, are able to administer the test, which is called psychopathy checklist revised. So in, in that case, I really, really, I would not be concerned that you get a misdiagnosis. Mm -hmm. If you have a high score on the ch psychopathy checklist revised after you've reviewed file information and done the interview, and if the, if the person who's done the scoring is, is a, um, an accredited scorer, um, 
it's it's very unlikely that you you have a gonna have a cuddly buddy buddy as a psychopath or you're gonna have a psychopath who's somehow managed to moonlight uh, as a cuddly bunny uh-huh yeah especially in adult psychopaths it's it's not only that you hear that they're like violent and erratic you also hear about uh their charm so i would imagine that um especially an intelligent psychopath might be able to charm an interviewer and just you know act perfectly friendly uh do you know anything about whether that's so, so uh... this is why you combine it with the file information uh -huh. so so it is and and it's in fact often the discrepancy between the interview and the file in information that can be hugely telling mm -hmm. so i remember a long time ago when i when i was um doing work in prisons interviewing uh, a a prisoner who was who was indeed incredibly charming and uh, very pleasant and um you know gave me this spin spin <laughs> the yarn about you know how he's just devastated that he's he's in prison and he's particularly devastated because he's got a young son and he he really wanted he was building up a business he wanted to look after his young son and he just found it absolutely devastating he didn't be there for for uh, for the son and i was i was um thinking oh gosh this sounds really really awful and then i went to his file uh, where it was clear that he had five children with four different women, none of whom he had ever looked after financially. So there was a very clear discrepancy. So in, in real life, of course, you may be taken in by somebody uh, who comes and tells you uh, a very convincing story. But what emerges then over time is that the stories don't match up with the real life delivery. So often people who have been uh, in a relationship with individuals who have high levels of psychopathy talk about the fact that, you know, they were at first absolutely charmed and swept off their feet, but then relatively quickly cracks started appearing. So the person could really switch their, uh, almost switch their personality. When they didn't get what they want, they suddenly became incredibly angry and incredibly uh, emotionally or physically abusive. Although, you know, a few days ago, they had been very, very charming and sweetness and light. And they didn't meet the obligations, even though they talked the talk of, I will do this and that for you. So it, I think that the sort of the charming manipulative bit, you can, everyone can be taken in for a while, but it, it's never going to last, last because these individuals are often not capable of, of being consistent enough. And because they are so self-involved, at some point it becomes very clear that actually this person is only charming in order to get what they want, not because they have my interests at heart. Mm -hmm, that makes sense. How aware do they tend to be about this, uh, this self-interest? Is it, is it sort of like out of their control, it's due to these brain differences? Or is it, is it like a conscious choice of, I know I'm manipulating this person and I like it? I'm not sure that it's sort of either or. I think it's many whom I've talked to are, are aware that they are different and many actually view it as an asset. They sort of sometimes, uh, you know, a few have said to me, you know, I feel sorry for other people because they're so swayed by, the, by their emotions and they're so worried about how everyone else is feeling and they can't sort of do what's best for them. So many that I've met sort of view this ruthlessness that they have as an asset and view other people as weak. And I think this is obviously partly because of how their brains are different. Uh, and I think many of them have insight to the fact that it's different, but I'm not sure that they necessarily view it as a, as anything but a, <laughs> but a sort of an asset. Uh -huh. So you mentioned that, that, that some view it as pe people who have experienced normal emotions, the emotions get in the way of their rational decision-making. Some psychopaths see themselves as more rational. And I know that there have been some studies done with like gambling experiments in, in both uh, psychopaths and normal controls. And I mean, I could see it going either way. I don't remember any particular results, but on one hand, you have people who can detach themselves from their emotions and maybe make the most rational decisions. But on the other hand, you have people that might be prone to, to anger when they don't get what they want. Or, or I don't think it's again. I don't think it's an either or thing. I think it's probably context dependent. So I think, depending on what what is it that you want to achieve, I think it mm -hmm. can be an asset or it can be a handicap. Uh -huh. And and so I don't I, I don't think that that's sort of a. I mean, I would overall view it as a handicap because obviously in our human interactions, 
and in much of our decision making, we do rely on affective signals. And if those affective mm -hmm. signals are muted, you're going to make less good decisions and you're going to make you're going to be less able to engage in optimal social interactions with other group living animals. But then there may be the odd occasion where looking after number one works very well for you. And in those sorts of situations, it's, it may be a, a sort of a, at least from a subjective point of view, a good thing that the emotions don't get away. But I, I'm not sure that the fact that they are themselves reflecting that this is an asset rather than a handicap is the same as, as sort of saying, okay, objectively, this is an asset as an, as, instead of a hand, handicap in all situations. Mm -hmm. Kevin Dutton wrote a book called The Wisdom of Psychopaths. And in it, he talks about how it's not all negative. I mean, obviously you have the charm, but you also have the ability to um, to be more competitive and where, where that's necessary. So, so again, we talked about like being a politician or a CEO, it's probably helpful to have at least some level of, of um, psychopathic traits. And it's only after a certain point, do you, does it, does it become harmful? Yes, and I think like, um... Like many things, you know, whether something is good or bad will start slightly also depend on whose point of view are you looking at mm -hmm. uh, from. So what may be good for individual or better for individual may not be better for the group. So right. I think it's even, even at the lower levels, sometimes you look at the politicians, for instance, or CEOs, and you think, yep, yeah, being like that, certainly the sharp elbows served you well. But whether whether they are something that necessarily served your community well, your community well, I think that is that is more questionable. So earlier you mentioned doing twin studies, and is it is it common if you have someone who's who's a psychopath and a twin? Is their twin likely to have the same personality since they have the same DNA, or is it is it something else? And you can have one twin who's normal and one twin who has uh, like a, a mental disorder. So it's definitely, you know, it's not a kind of a, if your twin has high levels of this, you will definitely have high levels of these traits. Mm -hmm. If you're an identical twin, it's more probable that you also have high levels of these traits, although not necessarily to quite the identical level of, of your of your affected twin. And mm -hmm. if you are a non-identical twin, obviously, because these are genetically influenced traits and you only share 50% of your DNA, uh, there it's, it's more... Um, it's not as um, as said that you will have have uh, high levels of these traits if your co twin has the traits. But definitely, because this is a heritable trait, we see more similarity between identical twins than we see between non identical twins. But obviously, like for every every pretty much trait that we study, we can sometimes have big discrepancies even in the identical twins. Uh -huh. um, so the identical twins can have very different experiences of intrauterine environment, for instance, uh, and they can also have very different experiences uh, after they have been born. And that can lead into sort of divergent phenotypic outcomes, even though they have um, the same DNA. Mm -hmm. So do we, do we know any specific examples that, that have been shown to, to increase risk, even, even among twins? Like identical well, twins? Um, there is a, I think a more actually convincing data comes from uh, an, an adoption study that was uh, led by my colleague Luke Hyde, uh, where they looked at children who were genetic risk for antisocial behavior, and they looked at the development of their callous and emotional traits. And these children were at, at higher risk than your sort of average, average adopted away child uh, mm -hmm. for developing callous and emotional traits. But if they received uh, warm and consistent parenting, that that genetic risk uh, expression was reduced. So their study was very nice in showing that yes, genetic risk does uh, increase your likelihood of developing callous and emotional traits, but it's not a test destiny. So if you have higher levels of warm and consistent parenting, then that counteracts the genetic risk. So. The kind of even a flip the coin, uh, the message is that if you have a genetic risk and then your parents are not able to be warm and consistent, then you are also at an increased risk of, of developing uh, callous and emotional traits. And of course, you might speculate that in biological families, the parents may share some of the traits of the children. So the children may get this sort of double whammy of being at genetic risk and then having also parents who are maybe less capable in providing warm and, and consistent parenting. Mm 
Mm -hmm. I remember some other adoption studies not looking at psychopathy <clears throat> in particular, uh, and they show that over time, rather than what you'd expect, the children becoming more like their adopted parents as they spend more time raised by them, they become more like their biological parents as they, they grow older and these genetic factors take over. Yeah, and I think part of that, those genetic factors sort of potentiating is via this mechanism of gene environment interplay. So if you can think of a very temperamentally difficult child, that child will elicit very different parental reactions than a child who's very temperamentally easy. So a child who's constantly in a negative mood, oppositional, has tantrums, is dysregulated, will be a lot harder to parent consistently and warmly than a child who is, uh, is more easygoing and pleasant and wants to please you. So I think that there are sort of way, ways in which these sort of genetic effects bleed into the environment, evoke certain reactions in parents and peers, and then sort of consolidate uh, particular problematic traits if there isn't a, a very skilled set of adults around that child who can counter um, that genetic risk. Mm -hmm, that makes sense. So on one hand, you talk about <clears throat> being raised in a warm and supportive environment is important for the child. But on the other hand, if you have a child who's um, very... Challenging. Yeah, very, very challenging, then they might just take advantage of that uh, compassion. So what, what's the balance between that? Or rather, what's the most optimal strategy for raising a disorderly child? I think warm and warm and consistent doesn't mean that you're necessarily taken for a ride. I think you can be warm and consistent and still be wise to the child being a bit tricky and and trying to pull a fast one. Uh, I mean, I think that the the big challenge really is that with the really challenging children, parents who have demanding otherwise demanding lives are in, at risk of burning out. So it's so the one thing that I have been so banging on about for a long time is, is that we do need to, rather than sort of stigmatize and blame the parents when the child has behavioral problems, we have to try and sort of think, well, could we somehow collaborate with the parent and the, or parents and the child and provide a kind of scaffolding for, for the parents when they deal with the child? But let's face it, most of us would not want to spend 24 seven, seven days a week with. Um, and I've got a, Got a great colleague in um, in Australia called Eva Kimonis, who's been developing some really interesting uh, early um, treatments for children uh, with conduct problems and callous and emotional traits, where they invite the parents to their laboratory and the parents wear this headpiece, and uh, they are behind a one-way mirror, and the therapists um, essentially uh, help the parent to say the right things to the child and reinforce the right behaviors to the child. And when the child behaves very badly, the parent is usually exhausted. And there are so few occasions for praise that an exhausted parent is likely to miss many of them. Mm -hmm. So essentially kind of what they get going in this therapy is that they, they help the parent reinforce the behaviors that they want to see and almost sort of get the parent and the child back on a better track which then means that the child is progressively easier, which will then give more mutual enjoyable moments to the child and the parent. And it sort of gets them off this maladaptive uh, trajectory, which can easily happen. I mean, the kind of children we see for our research, I really, really genuinely do not know how many of the parents cope with it 24 seven. And I think a lot of them just simply switch off and have a bit of burnout because it is so challenging and so unrewarding uh, and it's mm -hmm. easy to come in from the outside and judge the parents and say well you should do this and you should do that and many of the things that they should do will work for typically developing children but are unlikely to work for their children and I don't think at the moment as a society we have a huge amount of compassion for those parents or a lot of help available for them and I think it also partly reflects the fact that these children don't elicit the same level of sympathy and empathy than children who are on the autism spectrum or children who um, have anxiety disorders, for instance. We can all empathize with those conditions, but when you have a child who's really difficult and violates the rights of others, they're not exactly going to be a poster boy for a campaign where you're gonna see lots of people rushing in to sort of advocate for them and, and to donate money for that cause. So I think, mm -hmm. There is a sort of, a, there's an image problem, understandably, but I think it's something that we do need to educate uh, 
people about because you can help these kids and it is actually in the society's best interest to do so but they are not going to pull your heartstrings as easily as as someone who who uh, who has maybe uh, problems with things that we can more easily identify with or who behave in ways that elicit more sympathy mm -hmm, that's a great point when these interventions are done what age of the child is is it typically done at so if I remember correctly from Eva's studies, her particular intervention focuses on, on sort of preschool children. So maybe sort of four mm -hmm. to six year olds, uh, possibly even slightly younger. Uh, but there are, there's also other data showing that interventions can work with, uh, with older children. Um, so it's, it's not that somehow if, if you don't get there early on, you completely miss the boat, but clearly you then have to do different things with slightly older children. Mm -hmm. um, because the developmental um, tasks for those children are different. Right, and the older the children get, the more uh, they, they become socialized uh, by their peers rather than within the family. So do you see, is, is it something like all of the um, callous, unemotional, aggressive kids tend to band together and then like um, snowball each other? Or, well, does that, yeah, does that happen? So I think there is currently relatively little research on PS. There are a few studies, uh, some of which suggest that these kids might actually sort of recruit lackeys and manipulate uh, other children. And it would be hard for me to see how very many of them would exist in the same peer group um, simply because of their utter lack of sort of loyalty and manipulativeness. So. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think the relations would quickly break down if if you had a kind of a several of them in the same peer group. Um, but to be fair, we do not have enough good uh, peer data on these children at the moment. So that's sort of slightly speculative. And what we have is very meager. So that is an area that is clearly a, um, really, really interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. So you've mentioned... Uh... Other, other disorders children can have, like anxiety disorders, and those are typically more internalizing. I'm wondering, is there such a thing as like an internalizing psychopath, like someone who is just as uh, callous and unemotional, uh, but who doesn't have the, like the, the, the problem disorders? Does, does that make sense? Someone who would- it makes sense. So, so there is an old re recent literature in adult, um, uh, offenders, uh, which focuses on primary and secondary psychopathy, as they're called, mm -hmm. uh, and where the primary psychopathic individuals are individuals who really don't feel empathy and, um, and, and are, are sort of not, don't have internalizing uh, disorders. And then you have in, individuals who, who may, on a behavioral level, look like they, they callous and they lack empathy, but who clearly also have extremely high levels of internalizing disorders. Mm -hmm. And um, until very recently, this hadn't really ha hadn't been looked at in children and young people. But uh, Eva Kimonis, who I already mentioned, um, has looked into it in adolescence. We've looked into it in adolescence as well, uh, and few other people have started to do this work as uh, now as well, uh, including Costas Fanti in Cyprus, who's done some really lovely research using um, both behavioral and, and psychophysiological uh, methods. And what seems to emerge is that you can, you can have a combination of, of uh, callous and emotional traits and, and anxiety uh, and, and conduct problems. And these children really are, they are the most multi-morbid children you have, and they have often very poor outcomes and often also have maltreatment uh, histories. Uh, however, they look very different in terms of their psychophysiological signature, if you like. So they do uh, show affective response, for instance, skin conductance response uh, to um, emotional stimuli and other people's distress. Whereas the kids who have callous and emotional traits and conduct problems, but who do not have the internalizing spectrum, don't, don't show that. So um, Eva and I have called this a, a a behavioral phenocopy, if you like. So this just shows to us, you know, how all the all the disorders and diagnoses we do, we do it at the symptom level. Uh -huh. So my educated guess is that at the behavioral level, you can look unempathetic and unemotional, but actually at the neurocognitive level and possibly at the level of uh, of the origins of behavior, uh, there are 
clear differences between those who have the callous traits in combination of anxiety and callous traits uh, not in combination of anxiety. And I would, I would sort of, my educated guess would be that if you have uh, genetic predisposition to, um, to having these traits, uh, you won't have comorbid anxiety because, it, it, you know, you are likely to have those genetic variants that uh, decode sort of lower affective responsiveness, lower affiliative orientation. And then you might have another group of children who have had such, for instance, extreme early childhood experiences that it is, it has made them behave in a callous and unempathic way, but that doesn't mean that they don't have this emotional reactivity um, to uh, others' distress or to the threat. So in a way, it's sort of what level of analysis you look at. So you come at the behavioral level, you can have the combination, but the causes, uh, causes uh, appear to be different uh, depending on whether you have internalizing with callous or not internalizing with callous and emotional. Sorry, that was a bit mm -hmm. long-winded. <laughs> no, that's okay. I think it would be good to close with, if, if you're comfortable sharing your personal opinions on, on uh, sort of the ethics of, of psychopathic behavior, it, it sort of comes back to this, how much of it was their decision, how much of it uh, was outside of their control. Because, you know, on one hand, if you have someone who's uh, behaving antisocially, especially criminally, uh, you don't want to get them, let them get away with that. But on the other hand, if it's due to uh, genetic factors or a harsh upbringing, it doesn't necessarily seem fair to punish people for things outside of their control. So it's kind of a lose-lose situation. And what do we do about that? So interestingly, this was actually a topic of a, a special science and the law seminar at the Royal Society, which is the UK Academy of um, National Academy of Sciences, where um, I, I gave a talk together with my colleague Ariel Baskin Sommers from Yale University. And we were, we were considering these very issues. And I think our shared view is that if you have committed crimes that have violated the rights of other people, and you uh, pose continual danger to other people, there is no doubt that you have to be apprehended and there will, will have to be consequences uh, for those crimes. However, at the point of the um, sentencing decisions, there are, depending on which legal tradition you are in, which country you are in, you know, you might either be incarcerated and not get any therapeutic input, or you may be incarcerated to a facility which acknowledges the fact that you have an you have a handicap essentially, you have a mental emotional handicap, and then tries to work with you to counter the effects of that handicap or to remedy that handicap. So my view would be that first of all, that it's good if we can recognize these sorts of traits in children and do some of the work before these traits and behaviors become so entrenched and so troublesome that rights of other people are violated. So that's the reason to focus on the children. But if we haven't got there in time, then I think a decent society offers therapeutic facility for individuals like that, rather than just locks them away and, and throws the key away. Dr. Veeding, thank you. Thank you very much.